Um, so the social contract, um, I don't know, I need to tell you that much about that, but you all know about social contract theory. Um, it, um, and some call this a uh, class compromise, expanded workers' rights, uh, extended restrictions on the freedom of contract, recognized collective rights and obligations of labor unions to represent workers' interests, established welfare state protections against market risks. Um, as a doctrine, the social contract inscribes distri distributed principles undergirding political consent as a necessary scaffolding to support the design of institutional architectures that ensure social cohesion. Uh, social contracts um, have varied in accordance with dominant principles operating um, across different types of welfare states and varieties of capitalism. On the one hand, access to the market was the primary means of democratization of wealth advocated by liberal U.S. Um, policymakers. On the other, institutionalized social protection was pursued by most European countries. Um, Japan sort of um, drew on elements from both um, into a kind of hybrid social contract, anchoring social protection in large corporate structures in support of a strong male breadwinner reproductive a bargain around the image of the salaried man. So I know that this is a kind of very, um, I, 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 at the beginning of the talk said, um, Japan Inc. was stylized, and this is a very static representation of this kind of model. Um, but I want to see that as, um, at what moment did this kind of reproductive bargain sort of take shape, what are the social forces, and I'll talk about that in terms of the history, um, the short history of Japan. Um, and reproductive bargain, I, the reason I'm bringing this um, into social contract theory, social contract theory is mostly about workers' rights at the site of production. And there is a kind of hinting that social reproduction is important, um, care work, and other kinds of um, uh, reproductive labor uh, is necessary, but not discussed in terms of, of how that is related to patterns of the labor market. Uh, and, and, and economic outcomes. So um, I want to bring in sort of institutionally the relationship between reproductive bargains and the, this broader concept of a social contract. Um, for me, types of reproductive bargain are based on the relative weight distributed to and boundaries between public and private responsibility for social provisioning um, by state, market, and family. This arrangement uh, determines access to and distribution of entitlements, benefits, protections, risks, and opportunities. Uh, a reproductive bargain is at heart a political process. You, um, and I'll talk more about that um, in a moment. In the Japanese case, um, uh, this I call a strong male breadwinner model. Um, and in a strong male breadwinner model, paid work and family are difficult to reconcile, given the lack of market base, like in the US case, or the liberal model case, or publicly provided services, as in the Scandinavian case, the social democratic case, to replace women's familial care work, and the inflexibility of paid <coughs> work for caregivers. The labor market has be, uh, been focused on insiders with little state encouragement to develop these kinds of services, and therefore, these kinds of um, uh, frictions that we see now um, in, in Japan. More specifically, in the corporate-centered male breadwinner reproductive bargain, firm-specific skill development and corporate-based benefits reward long-term standard employment relationships, um, underdevelop uh, underdeveloping statutory entitlements, and the social infrastructure of care services, while training and wage-setting institutions have uh, leave non-standard employment to flourish unprotected yet not unregulated. So, um, in this kind of um, some comparative model, I group Germany and Japan in, in the strong male breadwinner reproductive bargain, uh, very, uh, but with a, a different kind of um, uh, male breadwinner in terms of the um, institutionalization of collective bargaining uh, and, and, and industrial relations or now employment relations. So you have um, greater protection of labor on a national level in Germany than you do in Japan. And that's why the difference is because of the, uh, the way that labor is organized in the German case. But there are very similar sort of patterns that you see in terms of precarious employment and its gendering in Germany uh, and Japan. 
architect of this. <laughs> nice, nice kind of pastoral, you know, <laughs> so that we could uh, now think about history <laughs> for a moment. Um, so now I want to turn to the second section, which is a kind of chronicle, historical chronicle. In a very short period of time, historians, you know, always, and anthropologists say, oh, you're only going to be there for six months? God, that's not long enough. You can't really do field work in six months. And historians say, you're going to do the history of post-war Japan, contemporary Japan, in two pages? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm going to try to, because I want to talk about these turning points as, as important. Um, at the uh, end of the Second World War, um, the Japanese state embarked on an ambitious modernization project uh, to build the, the war-torn nation. Um, promoting rapid industrialization as a late industrializer in my paper that talks about that. Um, providing tax incentives and other subsidies, accelerating the shift from agriculture to manufacturing, uh, which fueled the exodus from rural communities uh, to factories and offices in um, sprawling uh, urban areas. Economic expansion that followed during the 1960s stabilized employment relationships for many salary men who moved into more secure employment in core industries. At the same time, many working class women toiled in low wage, non union work <coughs> jobs crucial to the textile and consumer electronics industry. The corporate uh, centric male breadwinner model was born out of the ashes of labor's defeat after militant strike activity paralyzed large scale industry in the 1950s. Andrew Gordon has written about um, these struggles. Others have written about the struggles. And again, it's, um, it really sort of flies in the face of the idea that there's this kind of consensus orientation um, uh, of uh, Japan, that there wasn't uh, a struggle. That in fact, the backdrop for this political accommodation came from the defeat of labor. And it was very militant, uh, particularly in large-scale industry. The very place where you find this male breadwinner model, that if you look at Japan and its presentation of the model, it's as if that model has always existed. <laughs> it's a re it reinvents or invents a kind of a tradition. So, this class compromise and the sort of weakness of labor, in a sense, because it was anchored within uh, the corporation, um, was because of you know, the accommodation that they made within uh, the enterprise. Uh, this welfare model uh, standardized benefits around a work biography of continuous employment over the life course and apportioned rights, responsibilities, and risks in terms of a relatively stable employment relationship for insiders. Most unions embedded in micro-corporatist arrangements con uh, concentrated collective bargaining on achieving job security and improving company-based welfare benefits for the core male membership. So this is the 1950s and 1960s, we have an expanding economy. 1970s, uh, Japan uh, is hit by two coincidental shocks. First is the, the uh, oil shock. Uh, so, um, and that uh, shock um, was important to Japan because it's an oil import dependent country. And so um, they are uh, having to respond to that. Secondly, um, externally, you have uh, globalization. So Japan no longer can sort of protect its sunrise in industries behind the tariff walls that that they had before. There's still the high tariffs, but now you have a economic landscape globally that's quite different in terms of the kinds of products. This is where China, Korea, the rest of East Asia, and Southeast Asia comes in. Um, so here, the state has to sort of respond to these kinds of uh, shocks. The, the, uh, the other shock is an internal shock. That is, the state-led uh, industrialization process depleted the resources of cheap labor extracted from rural areas in agricultural sectors. So there's no more cheap labor to draw on. So where are they going to get uh, cheap labor to keep going, to sustain this model, to sustain those, those benefits, if, uh, especially as the economy uh, begins to flip? Um, I argue that salarymen, um, at least uh, rhetorically, um, are at the center of, the, of this model of capitalism. Um, and the male breadwinner would be protected bargain in, in uh, Japan, Japanese case. Uh, the term salaryman dates back to the Taisho period uh, of 1912 and 26, but this expression of masculinity that's signified by the construct of salaryman uh, really circulated um, during the 1960s. By one estimate, salaryman accounted for less than 10% of the employed workforce in pre-war Japan. Increased, and so it's not something that they was inherited, that it's been there all the time, it's really new. It's, you know, it's contemporary Japanese history, uh, one that, um, again, comes out of these uh, particular 
um, turning point. Um, increasing to around 50% of household heads by 1955 and, and 75% in 1970. Um, I think this estimate exaggerates the real number of salary men by including all full-time male employees receiving a monthly salary in the category. But I think it underscores ideologically the centrality of the middle class heterosexual citizen worker in Japanese culture and politics. So it does sort of function in, in a way, not only in terms of real people's lives and family structures, but in terms of ideologically. Um, and this image of the salary uh, man uh, or male breadwinner both allowed and compelled men to devote long hours as workers in capitalist corporations and to fulfill their roles as taxpayers, juxtaposed to women who occupied positions as, or were supposed to occupy positions, not that they necessarily did and didn't resist, um, as good wives and wise mothers on behalf of the nation. During the 1980s, this is what we have even prior to the economic crisis, the, the uh, Japanese government um, takes on uh, the welfare state and benefits, and they construct, um, or they call uh, their welfare model the Japanese-style welfare, to differentiate it from European-style or even liberal um, uh, um, welfare models in the U.S. Um, they framed reform in terms of a supposedly Japanese tradition, simultaneously referencing the past, male standard, and selectively formulating new regulations, including the passage of the Equal Employment Opportunities Act in 1985, and we can talk more about that, and, and, and this is an important and, um, also revisions to the tax law. The revision they had to the tax law was to exempt a threshold of income earned that was roughly equivalent to a part-time worker's income. So if the mother worked part-time, there'd be no tax consequence, no tax penalty for um, mothers to go out and work part-time. So there was a real incentive to do that. So you have on the one hand, you have equal employment opportunities being promoted, symbolically at least, um, and there are questions about it. It's more than symbolic. Uh, and then on the other, trying to encourage uh, women to work in these, um, these jobs, particularly um, part-time, but also uh, temporary work. The economic downturn in the 1990s, it's not that it wasn't important. It was important. It did, in fact, erode the basis of the reproductive uh, uh, bargain and of the model. So fewer people, so we have a shrinking core of salarymen. Um, who um, are enjoying the benefits and social protections. Um, the jobs that are being created, certainly for women, it's over 92% is um, uh, precarious employment, non standard employment. Um, and new jobs and old, old jobs are being converted into precarious employment, and new jobs are created as non standard. So uh, the 1990s is important, as a, again, as a uh, turning point, but it's built on, it's still trying to preserve that model. Uh, while sort of adding uh, you know, these, these bits. Um, so the, the promise of lifetime employment has not disappeared, either as a practice or an expectation. And I say, I use those words very carefully because people think that the lifetime employment system is a, a contractual guarantee. It's not. It's a practice. Although what's interesting, if you look at labor law, there have been cases in which uh, uh, workers who have been laid off when um, by a, a large company, that they were able to win their job back because the practice is very uh, uh, strong uh, in, in Japan. Um, so um, more, uh, more uh, non-regular jobs or atypical jobs are being uh, um, created uh, for women, youth, and older workers, and also um, has had an effect on salary men uh, losing uh, the security that w uh, was once provided by the three treasures. Uh, the three treasures of lifetime employment, seniority, uh, promotion, and company union. So that model is beginning to at least erode. Employment insecurity undermines the ideological and economic basis of the old hegemonic reproductive bargain represented by the salary of man, an issue I'm going to return to at the end of my paper. 